All right, well, uh, looking there at John 13, and what's been happening in the context here is that Jesus has been teaching his disciples what it means to really love one another, what it means to really love one another. Do you know what it is to really love one another? And Jesus is teaching that, and uh, we're going to continue to learn more principles of what it means to really love others as we continue on. Now we're going to verse 21, and uh, Jesus, or John is writing, he says, after saying these things, what things? This is that Jesus has told the disciples love each other, and here's how. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to wash their feet, and so Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and even though the disciples should have been doing the vice versa, they should have been washing Jesus' feet, here's Jesus. Jesus, God, washing puny humans' feet, nasty and gross, and he's doing it to show them what real love is about. And so that's what after saying these things means. And then it says, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. He's troubled in his spirit, it's terasso in the Greek. It's a deep troubling and agitation, a deep concern. His, he's, he's worked up in a, because of a, something that's going on in a bad way. And what is this? Because he knew his hour had come, if you remember that from the last passage, his hour had come for his betrayer, betrayal, which would include one of his own 12 disciples, would turn on him and, and cause the, the ball to start rolling down the hill of his arrest and then his crucifixion. And so his, he's in turmoil. He's, he knows ahead that he's going to be betrayed by one of his own and what it's going to lead to. Verse 22, the disciples looked at one another. They're uncertain of whom he spoke. And one of his disciples whom Jesus loved was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So who's this disciple that Jesus loved? It's sort of debated throughout church history, but most of church historians and scholars would say they would be the Apostle John who wrote this very gospel itself, that he was the disciple Jesus loved. He was the one closest to Jesus. And so here's this table. And in the Passover meal, which is the meal that they're having, they would actually kind of like recline sitting down and leaning on their shoulders, on their elbows. And so John is at the right hand of Jesus, and he's closest to him. And that's what it's talking about there. And what we read on, and it says in verse 24, So Simon Peter mentioned to him, John, the disciple Jesus loved, to ask Jesus who he was speaking. Who is this person, Jesus, you say? Someone's going to betray you. And so that disciple leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? And so this whole picture here actually brings to our mind a very famous painting. Maybe you've seen this painting before, The Last Supper. And that's what's happening right here. And what you see there, other than the right hand of Jesus be on our left, as you're looking at it, would be John. Now, it's said that John is leaning closer to Jesus, but here in this painting, he is Over here, and somebody's speaking into his ear, and you know who that is. That would be Peter. This this painting is literally about this very moment that we're reading about in the scriptures when Peter says to John, John, you're closest to Jesus. Ask Jesus who is going to betray him. And so that's what we see. Now, verse 22 alludes to the fact that the 11 disciples had no idea that it was going to be Judas. Right? They're asking. Peter wants John to ask Jesus, who is it going to be? In fact, it might be that Judas was the last one on their mind, actually, to guess, to think. And here's why we think that might be true. Uh, imagine parents, if you have multiple kids, or if you're not, imagine you are, and you have multiple kids. And for some weird reason, you need to give all your household money to one of your kids to, to hold on to. Which kid are you going to choose? The one you can't trust, right? You're going to take the one that you feel is the most responsible, the one you feel like you can trust the most, and and have that child take care of the money. Judas was the one who took care of the money for the ministry of Jesus in the whole group. And so probably in the minds of the disciples, he would have been one of the last ones to guess that he would be the one to betray. But see, Jesus knew all along, didn't he? 
He knew all along. In fact, he's now going to reveal and expose Judas as the betrayer as we look at verse 26. Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. You see, this is very interesting because he's having the Passover meal. He's having this meal and he's taking bread and he dips it in some liquid and he gives it to Judas. And he even says ahead of time, hey guys, the person I'm going to give this to, that's the betrayer. And what's interesting with that in that culture was to offer bread to someone is a sign of friendship. He's exposing his betrayer by a sign of friendship. And then you fast forward, we're not there yet in this passage, but we'll get there in the Gospel of John. How does Judas betray Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane? By kissing him on the cheek in a sign of friendship. Sad, isn't it? A so-called friend turning his back on his Savior, Jesus Christ. So verse 27, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him and Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out and it was night. You see, what we're learning here from Jesus' words, what we're learning from Jesus' actions continually here is how to really love other people. And here's the first point I want to bring out this morning is that we are to love others by loving Jesus first. If we're going to love others, we need to learn how to love Jesus first. What do I mean by that? What I'm saying is that you can't really fully, purely love other people unless you first have learned to love Jesus for yourself first. And why do I say that? Because one, Jesus is the perfect model of who knows how to love perfectly, doesn't he? He was the perfect model. And so when we watch him, when we learn from Jesus how to love, now we know how to love other people well. And and, and right now some might be, well, Jesus isn't here, so how do you learn from him? Well, he is here in the pages of the scriptures. That's why we read the Bible. If you're a new believer and you're trying to learn how to now finally love other people, we encourage you to read the Gospels like John. Read about Jesus' life. And, and it's like, okay, so that's what Jesus did. Okay, that, that's, then I need to do that too. You learn from his model of how to love people. He's God in the flesh. But even more than the fact that Jesus is our model is that Jesus also gives us the Holy Spirit when we get saved. Amen. When we love him for the first time, salvation time, that he gives us the Holy Spirit. And now get this, not only do we have the model, but we have the ability to love. Because our sinful nature by itself, we're always going to fail. We're always, we could try, but we're, we're, we're never going to be able to really love people the way God has created us to because of our sinful nature. But when we surrender our life to Jesus, when we say, Jesus, I love you, and he, he gives us the Holy Spirit, now we have the ability to love the way Jesus loves us. Do you see that? And so we need to let Jesus in and to give us that power to do so, unlike Judas. See, Judas is sadly a negative example. Judas loved himself, didn't he? He he couldn't even begin to love the other 11 disciples because he didn't love Jesus for himself. He rejected Jesus. He kept the Holy Spirit outside of himself, and he did then what his sinful nature just simply wanted to do. He loved himself, and he even had Jesus modeling right in front of him every day, but he kept Jesus on the outside, and by doing that, Judas then allowed himself to be the prime vessel for Satan to use to try to stop the plan of salvation for you and for me to be saved today. Judas loved himself, kept Jesus on the outside, and became a vessel for Satan. I don't know about you, when when you're reading that passage, maybe you're like me, when we got to that part in verse 27, and it says, and Satan entered him, maybe you're like, well, that's weird. 
right? We're talking about a meal. We're talking about disciples. We're talking about this. And then this, you know, Satan entered him. I don't know, if, does that jump off the page to you like it does to me, to me? And so I thought maybe right now what we might do is have a quick theology lesson of six facts uh, from the Bible of the relationship between demons and people, all right? So six facts about this relationship with demons and people. Satan, by the way, is the leader of the demons, and then there's other demons, and then you have people like you and I. What does God tell us in the Bible about this relationship? Well, here it is. First, demons are more powerful than you and I. God actually made different creatures stronger than others. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 7, it says, as humans, he made us a little lower than the angels. He made them more powerful than we are. And uh, for instance, Satan was able to create a tornado and kill some of Job's family in the book of Job. Last time I checked, I couldn't create a tornado. And last time I checked, I couldn't fly like demons can fly. And they can do all these things. And so when you study demons, there's no question. They are more powerful than human beings. Secondly, demons can possess unbelievers, non-Christians. They can possess them. And um, now let me make this clear. They cannot possess believers. And the reason why is because Romans 8 tells us, 16 I think it is, that when we give our life to the Lord, as I was just talking about earlier, the God the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. And let me just tell you this. If you got God the Holy Spirit living inside of you, trust me, some demon's not taking up residence in the same house as the Holy Spirit. That, is just, that shit ain't going to happen, okay? They're going to duke it out, and guess who's going to win? God the Holy Spirit. A, a believer cannot be possessed, by a demon, but unbelievers can. And that's why we see Judas, and that's what literally happens in verse 27. He is possessed by a demon, which means that, a, that Satan, is Satan himself, that he enters into and he takes control like a puppet. And, and Judas is still in there, but Satan's in there, and Satan's stronger, and he's using Judas to do exactly his bidding and everything that he wants to do. Demon possession happened all the time in Jesus' ministry in his life. He was casting out demons left and right. You see it throughout the scriptures, and here's the thing, it still happens today. Just this last summer, I was sitting down with a business guy, and he's a believer, and he says, hey, by the way, I just want to share something with you, and I feel, I, I feel like it might be like a little weird, but I just have to tell you what I experienced. And about a year or so ago, he was, uh, he and his wife, and they have this coworker, and it's a long story, but basically they were at the person's house, uh, he and his wife and this female coworker, and the female coworker turned on the dime and began to cuss them out, scream at them, hatred in the eyes, speaking various languages, speaking the third person, the demon was talking through the person, through this woman, saying that this woman is mine, not yours. Uh, superhuman strength throwing couches across the room for hours, two times, separate events. This guy's not some crazy guy. This guy's a business guy, normal guy. He's like, am I crazy? <laughs> it's like, nope. And I can tell you more and more stories, guys, that demons are real and they can possess unbelievers. And... Um, and so we need to understand that that's what happened with Judas. Thirdly, demons can influence even governments themselves. Okay, if they can possess unbelievers, well, how many people in governments are not believers? And so you never know when that's happening. Well, also, they just can influence the governments all in one way or the other because 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that Satan is the god of this world. I mean, he owns this world. This is his world. It's also God's world ultimately. And there's battle going on until Jesus comes and ends it all. Can't wait for that. In fact, by the time you get to the end of the age, or the end of the world before Jesus comes back to end it all and, and annihilate Satan and throw him into the, the pit of hell forever, is that you see Satan get all the people of the world for the big final battle. And of course, Jesus wins. It's awesome. So demons can influence governments, and they do all the time. Four, demons can oppress, then this is going to change it now. This is what demons can do to believers. They can't possess us, but here's what they can do. Demons can oppress believers, oppress believers. I've personally experienced that when I went on a mission trip to Sri Lanka. The moment I showed up on the tarmac, there was me and another brother, and there was an oppression I cannot explain to you other than demonic forces. Um, they can oppress us. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Paul talked about that there was a messenger of Satan, a demon, who came to harass him. 
First Peter chapter five, verse eight says that Satan and demons can attack believers. They can oppress us. We are in a spiritual war, right? Fifth, demons can influence believers. A little different than oppress, they can influence us, which means they can get us, they can tap into our own sinful nature and manipulate us and influence to do, to do their will. It's different than possession. They're not taking over, but they're influencing us. And sometimes we do their bidding as a believer, as a believer. You're like, well, prove that to me. Well, I remember this time when Peter, believer, and uh, Jesus says to Peter, Satan, get behind me. Well, that's interesting because I'm pretty sure it's Peter standing there. Why, why, why is Jesus saying to Peter, Satan, get behind me? It's not because Peter was possessed, but he was being influenced. And Satan had gotten into his ear and into his heart and was causing Peter to basically, it's a long story, it's a whole thing, but trying to stop the plan of salvation. And Jesus says to, to Peter, but he actually speaks past Peter because Jesus knows all things and he knows that Satan's right there influencing one of his own people. That's a, that's a sobering thought, brothers and sisters in the Lord. Let's make sure that we are depending on the Lord and not allowing the evil one and his minions to influence us. A lot of the church divisions and problems, a lot of them, are because Satan's hard at work influencing believers. But here's some good news. Six, demons can be resisted in Jesus' name. They might be stronger. They might be crafty. But in the name of Jesus Christ, they can be resisted. James 4, 7 says we can resist the devil. Jude chapter 1, verse 9 tells us a specific way to do that. And that is we are to call on the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, when we do so. Because even Mark, Michael the archangel, who was the, third, the second most powerful creature, you had Lucifer himself, and then you have Michael. Michael's still on the good side. And when, Mike, when Michael, historically, has had to deal with Satan himself, he would not call upon his own name, his own authority, but he said, the Lord rebuke you, is what Jude tells us. He had to call on the name of Jesus, who is the creator and the king of all kings. And loved ones, let me just say this. May we not be discouraged or fearful of demons in an unhealthy way. We are children of the king of all kings. The name of Jesus is higher than any other. And so at times when I start to sense that maybe demonic forces are influencing me and I can tell you lots of different stories and they're attacking me, they're trying to oppress me. I just say in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you demons to leave me alone right now. And then I turn my attention to the Lord and say, Lord, just protect me. God, I'm yours. I love you. You're with me. And I claim his promises. Now, where do we get all of this? It's because Jesus is trying to teach us how to love each other. But if we're going to really love each other, we've got to make sure we've loved Jesus for the first at first. We've got to love him. We've got to get the Holy Spirit inside of us. Let me ask you, have you allowed the Holy Spirit inside of you? This teenage girl last week, she, up to that point, she had not. But she heard the call. And she said, I want God inside of me. And she believed in Jesus and she surrendered her life to him. And now she's a daughter of God. I encourage you, if you have yet to do that, do not wait anymore. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Love Jesus for the first time ever. Let's read on now, find the second principle about what it means to love other people. Look at John chapter 13, verse 31 now. Uh, when he, Judas, had gone out, uh, Jesus said, uh, now is the Son of Man glorified. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Whoa. Basically, he's saying, hey, the hour's here, and we're going to glorify ourselves. Satan, Judas, all these people, they're doing everything that we planned that was going to happen anyway. We're going to bring salvation to the world. We're going to glorify ourselves. That's what's going on. That's what Jesus is saying. But then he turns it back in 33, verse 33, and he takes it back to his disciples, the 11 now, that are left, and he loves them, and he says to them, little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, who are they? The Pharisees, the leaders of the Jewish people. So now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. What does that mean? Where, where's he going? He's, he's referring to his death on the cross. 
He's referring to his resurrection and then his ascension back into heaven. And he's telling them, he's saying, like, guys, you can't, you can't die the death I'm going to die. You're not going to raise to heaven like I'm going to. I'm going to be leaving you and, you, and you're not going to come with me. And so think about this. He knows that Judas just left, possessed now by Satan himself. And he knows that it's just a matter of time and his arrest is going to happen. And then the whole thing's going down. Jesus knows that. Imagine if you're in a room full of people that you love and someone betrays you and they leave and you know they're going to get the authorities to arrest you and you know you're going to die like at any moment. You know that's going to happen. The stuff that comes out of your mouth in those minutes now are going to be the most urgent, important things to your heart, aren't they? You know, you only have so much time to share some words with the people you love. And so you're going to tell them some things that are important, right? And so what does Jesus say to them? He says, hey, work hard, work your way up the corporate ladder. That's the most important thing for your life. So does Jesus say, you know, hey, obtain as much stuff as you can, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow. You might die because that's what this life is all about. So does Jesus say, hey, go Cubs. That's really important. No. <laughs> Whoa, I'm getting too out of control, aren't I? (laughs) Jesus is about to say really important things, isn't he? But I'm going to skip it. We're going to go to verse 36. Look at 36 with me. Simon Peter said to me, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me, but you will follow afterward. Peter said to him, Lord, why why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Now, what's really fun right now is that a lot of you right now maybe didn't even hear anything I just read because you're still stuck in the fact that I just built that drama up and I skipped the two verses and we went to verse 36, aren't you? You're like, you can't do that. No, no, what's the important thing Jesus said? And I skipped it, didn't I? Why did I do that? Because I forgot? No, it was on purpose. Here's why. Because I'm just doing what Peter did. See, Peter missed what Jesus said. Because when we read it there, Peter is stuck on the first thing Jesus said, which is, hey, I'm going somewhere and you can't go with me. He heard that. And then everything else after that was like, blah, 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 verse 34, 35, blah, 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 blah. What? You, Jesus, you're going, you're going somewhere? Uh-uh, no, uh-uh, I'm going with you all the way, right? And that's all Peter is stuck on. And, and, and you guys ever talk to someone and you're in a conversation and you can tell the person is checked out, <laughs> right? Hypothetically, I hear that happens with wives, with our husbands and things. I, I, I don't know, just hypothetically. You know, imagine, you know, uh, uh, guys, husbands, when we come home and our wife says, okay, a couple things. One, do you want to go to Jethro's to the bacon one? And you're like, oh, that sounds awesome. And you're like excited about it. And then she goes on and she's talking about her feelings and her day and her events. And the whole time it's like the Charlie Brown parents, blah, 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 blah. Because you're like, bacon, I can't wait to have my bacon, bacon, bacon. And the wife's just going on and pouring out her heart. And then finally done, she's like, are you listening to me? Yeah, Jethro's. Did you hear anything else that I just said, right? (laughs) You see, Peter completely misses 34 and 35. Jesus says before that, he says, hey, I'm going to go somewhere you can't go. And he misses it all because by the time you get to verse 36, he's like, look, look, where are you going? I'll go anywhere. I'll die for you, right? That's what Peter's doing. He's stuck on that. And so then Jesus dialogues with him on that. Now, here's the good news. We're going to come back to 34 and 35. Don't worry. Okay, we're not going to skip it. But there is a point that comes out, a really important point that comes out, though, in Peter's inability to pay attention and his dialogue, though, with Jesus. There's something that comes out that's good for us, challenging for us. Jesus, again, or Peter, he's stuck on this. Jesus, you're not going to go anywhere. I'll die for you, right? And Jesus looks at Peter with love and compassion. And he exposes Peter's shallow love, his good intentions, but because he knows the future, and he informs Peter, he says, Peter, not once, not twice, but three times before tomorrow morning, you're going to deny even knowing me. You see, Jesus is calling us to love. And what we learn 
From Peter's example and from others, we learn, though, that love must go beyond good intentions. Love must go beyond good intentions. What does intention mean? And to have an intention means that we're aiming to do something, we're planning to do something, but it doesn't mean we always carry it out. It doesn't always mean that there's fruition for our intentions. We're just hoping to do something. And what we see in this event that occurred is we have at least three people who had intentions. We have Judas, his intentions, they were clear, and his intentions were just evil all around. He just loved himself, he was all about himself, and honestly, he was, at least he was consistent with his intentions, right? He betrayed the Son of Man, and he got everything that he deserved. But then you have Peter. He had intentions, didn't he? His intentions were to follow his Savior to the point of death. He loved Jesus no matter what, but sadly, his intentions were just only that. He didn't love Jesus to the end at that point. Instead, he denied Jesus. But then we have Jesus as the third character. His intentions were clear, and he brought them to fruition. He completed what he said he was going to do. He loved and showed his love by his actions. And we find that, he talked about that, and actually back in John 12, I have it on the screen for you, verse 27, and so Jesus said, so now my soul is troubled. You see the pattern there? Chapter 12, his soul is troubled. Here we are in chapter 13, his soul is troubled. I mean, this, is, this was heavy on his heart. But then he says this, but what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. He's thinking about the rest, and he's thinking about the cross. But he says, but for this purpose, I have come to this hour. My intention and the Father's intention, the Holy Spirit's intention before the foundations of the world was that I would come for this very moment. See, there's there's the intentions. In verse 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, he's talking about the crucifixion, will draw all people to himself. And here's the good news, as we know from history. Jesus' intentions was to come lay down his life so that you and I can have the opportunity to be forgiven of our sins and find ourselves in heaven with the Father forever, amen? But I'm so thankful that his love didn't just stop with good intentions. Jesus loved us beyond them, and he fulfilled what he meant to go out to do. We need to make sure we're loving people beyond just good intentions. You know, how many times, this is convicting for me, how many times when I see someone, oh man, so good to see you again. We need to get together for coffee sometime. We need to do, oh, we need to do that sometime, you know. Every time, hey, we need to go golfing sometime. And next time you see them, hey, we need to, you know, you know what I'm talking about? We all do it to some degree, and some of us worse than others. Instead, we need to stop saying that all the time, the good intentions, and we need to follow through. And, uh, and I find myself doing that. After I've done that once or twice with someone, three times maybe, I don't know, and finally I'm like, all right, I'm getting my calendar out right now, right? We're going to get it on the calendar. We're gonna, I'm going to follow through with my good intentions because that's what real love is. Small groups. I love this small group. I'm a part of this small group. I love the people in my small group. Good intentions. But when you look at sometimes just simply the presence, the attendance of some small group members, there's a disconnect. And I love my small group members, but I'm never there, but I love you. I'll be honest with you, we don't want people just saying that we love each other with good intentions. We want action. We want your presence to begin with. Same thing sometimes when we serve on a ministry within the church. I'm on the team. I want to serve the Lord, and I'm never there for whatever those reasons are over and over. You see what I'm saying? This is convicting, isn't it? This is hard. I wore my steel toe boots today because I needed it. <laughs> Let me hit this even to one of the most sensitive areas, but it's needed to be said. There are some spouses listening to my voice right now. And you're in your heart, you are screaming for your spouse to hear this right now. You're saying, spouse, husband, wife, I know you keep saying you love me, but I need you to show it. Thank you for your good intentions. And for your words, 
but I need you to follow through with some sort of action because I'm starving for that love in my life. So convicting for me. Man, I'm gonna speak to us right now. It's one thing for us to say, wife, I love you. Wife, I know we need some time together. Wife, I know that we need a date night. But if we just keep saying it and we don't stop and get the calendar out and make it happen. And guys, we are the leaders of our marriage. And if it doesn't happen, if date nights won't happen, don't go with my wife. No, it's ours. And so I say this for all of us as men. Guys, let's love beyond just good intentions. Let's show our love by our actions. Amen? Amen. It's challenging and convicting, isn't it? And so we're going to go now. We're going to find our third final principle of how to really love one another. And, uh, and now we're going we're gonna to listen to what Jesus said in verses 35 and 30, 34 and 35. Unlike Peter, he, he missed it, and he got it, I'm sure, later. But we're going to listen in. Here's Jesus. He's like, I only have so much more time now left with you. Judas is off. He's going to arrest. I want to tell you something really, really important. Look at verse 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so also are you to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciple if you have love for one another. Here it is. We are to show that Jesus is alive by your love for other Christians. Show that Jesus is alive. He's not just some dead historical figure, but show that he's alive today. How? To other people? By loving other Christians. Specifically, he says love one another. He's talking about within the life of the church, we are to love each other. You see, our love within as Christians for each other should set us apart from the world around us, the way that we love each other, the way that we serve each other, the way that we give gifts to one another, the way that we look out for one another. It should be a loud uh, evidence to the world outside of a church by looking in that there's something different and maybe Jesus is not just some dead historical figure, but maybe he's alive and he's changing people today is by the way that we love one another. And you want to know one of the most screaming loudest evidences of our love for each other that should set us apart from the world? You ready? Here it is. When somebody in the church sins and offends against me, that I, instead of running for the hills, leave the church, leave the small group, I forgive. Forgiveness in the outside world is very rare, very rare. But it should be a mark of God's people because we're going to sin against each other at times. Sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. It's going to happen because we're not perfect this side of eternity. But this should scream to the outside world. There's something different about those people, how they love each other. They're even willing to forgive each other when they sin against each other. You see, Jesus did the work for the gospel to exist. He lived the perfect life we couldn't. He died the cross on the cross for us. He rose from the dead, something we couldn't have done. He did all the work for the gospel to exist. But you and I as Christians, we've been called to be messengers of this gospel by the way that we live our lives among each other. And the way that we live our lives for each other will affect the reception on the other end when we carry the gospel. So for instance, uh, when we're sharing the gospel with people, what we're saying to them is, if you give your life to God, you get God. And you also get God's people. That's what we're saying. If you're willing to surrender your life to Jesus, you get God, first and foremost, awesome, and you get God's people. But imagine, this will be fun. Up here, this will be good. Okay, so <laughs> we are Christians, and you are an unbeliever, okay? And I'm, I'm telling you, I'm standing here with my Christian family, my church, you know, these Christians around. I'm like, hey, you need to give your life to Jesus. If you do that, you get Jesus. You get him for yourself. He comes and lives inside of you. You get heaven forever. And you get, you get the church, these numbskulls. These guys, I can't stand them. They, they sin against me all the time. I can't stand to be around them. But you get them. 
right? When the church, when we can't stand, when we don't show love for each other, but we're telling people to give their life to Christ and they get the church, it's like, he's like, why in the world would I? Okay, maybe I'll come to know the Lord because I want Jesus and things, but I don't want, if that's how it is, I don't want that, right? Instead of... Give your life to Jesus, you get Jesus, you get the church, we love each other, and, and when you watch and you observe the church loving each other in ways that's different than the world, it's an aroma to the gospel message. You see that? That's what Jesus is saying. The way that you love for each other will show people that you are my disciples. You know, in membership classes, the big point, we just went through it last night with a group of people and just saying one of the major goals of the church is to have love for one another that sets us apart. I'm going to say it this way. Our mutual love either advances or hinders the gospel's delivery. Our mutual love either advances or hinders the gospel's delivery. When I was growing up as a kid, there was a friend of mine, this this, this boy, and he, he grew up in a trailer court not too far from my home, and uh, his, his mom was single, raising him. He never, I don't even think he knew his dad. He didn't have a dad figure in his life, and, and um, you know, just a very um, rough life upbringing in a lot of ways, but he had a great heart, and, and we became really good friends for years, and, and he would want to come over to my house, and I started picking up, my mom started picking up that he wanted to come to our house a lot. And eventually he just said, he's like, I love, just, I love being at your home. I love how you guys love each other. And you know what? Trust me, my family wasn't perfect, okay? And you saw some of that, I'm sure. But it was the love that my family was trying to have as we were believers in Jesus Christ for each other. And it was an aroma to him. He today loves Jesus and he has his own family and he's trying to form his family in the ways that he saw modeled in mine. I don't know if you've heard of Josh McDowell, an apologist, and God's used him in amazing ways through decades now, and his testimony is fascinating because he, he, he ran into these Christians at his university that he was going to. In fact, he actually picked on them and tried to make them feel like they were a bunch of idiots. But instead, they would enter into intellectual arguments and such and meet him where he's at, that the Christian faith is not just some blind faith, but there's a lot of evidence for it. And so they're doing all this, and he began to do his own studies, and he uh, began to realize that, that intellectually it makes actually more sense that there's a God, and it's the God of the Bible, and all this stuff, and Jesus is true. And so he starts getting that, but he'll tell you in his testimony, he'll say, it wasn't just that part of it. But also, he said, I watched these guys, these Christians, and the way they loved each other and the way they loved me was like the, the thing that, the wind that just blew me over the cliff into Jesus' arms myself. Our love for each other is powerful. And think about Jesus. Jesus loved his imperfect, fallen, proud, selfish, angry, greedy, arrogant, ignorant, rebellious, hateful, and even at times annoying brothers, these 11 disciples, the 12 actually, he loved them all. He loved them all in both words and actions all the way up the hill onto the cross. And now he's calling you and I to do the same. 